in my experience uses document to try and downplay censorship in the USSR or pass the blame to local activists is the Central Committee letter on the purging of libraries from the 13th of June, 1933. You can find on such sites such as the Espresso Stalinist, where it is used to pass the blame for censorship onto other people, as well as attempting to paint it like censorship is on the decline, when in reality it was increasing during these years, which is obvious if you read the source document, but they're hoping you're not. On the left side of the screen is the version from the Espresso Stalinist, and the full version is on the right. Sure, they do the ellipses to show they are omitting things, but that's not a get out of jail free card. You're not supposed to edit the document to give a different impression, which is what I think is being done here. You can see the parts explaining the reason for the order has less to do with general opposition to library censorship, but that it is going too far in even censoring the works by government officials in good standing. They also cut C out. Now, they do provide some of Getty's context, while also lying. They went with saying that the library censorship was reduced in the early 1930s, which is not true, and even the bit they quote from Getty mentions there was a general tightening of literary discipline, which does not mean it was being reduced. It actually was increasing, but remained uneven. I notice this being done a lot, and I mean, hell, this is actually similar to how Lenin's collected works were edited and changed for the insertion of notes and titles to ensure, well, to help the reader come to the correct understanding of the words, as noted by the archive admins of Marxist.org. Except for those found in Lenin's major thesis, which are by the author, 95% of the footnotes and endnotes in the text of the Lenin collected works are from the editors. Some of the endnotes inserted by Progress's Stalinist editors in the editions up to and including the last editions in the 1970s are fraught with polemics aimed at prejudicing the reader against this or that Bolshevik or revolutionary who, since Lenin's death, had fallen out of favor with the current leadership of the USSR at the time the notes were inserted. So we have this headline on this to try and make you ignore what Getty is saying, which is a general issue I have with people citing Getty because Getty, like a lot of historians, is rather long-winded and any given paragraph is tying into larger context from the chapter, the book, as well as the author's other works. The Road to Terror is not really an introduction book, so there are certain assumptions Getty is making about what the reader should already know. Due to people cutting up Getty and using these sort of apologetics and lies, he has, I think, unfairly earned a reputation as a tanky historian. So I'm going to read from the start of chapter 3, and you're going to have to forgive me for how long this is, but I want to show the full context of Getty's words, and show in this case he would very much not agree with the people quoting his works. Literary censorship in this period provides an example of the ambiguous policies and direct attempts to construct the regime's dominant rhetoric and narrative. Since 1917, the Bolsheviks had suppressed publication of books and newspapers by their political opponents, but during the 1920s, the Stalinist leadership had often permitted the publication of statements and articles by various oppositionists within the party, at least until the moment of their defeat and expulsion. Trotsky's works were published until the mid-1920s, and Bukharin continued to publish Albert within controlled parameters until his arrest in 1937. He was in fact editor of the government newspaper, Ivetsia, until that time. The content of historical works had always played a role in Bolshevik politics. Part of the public dispute between the Stalinists and the Trotskyists in the early 1920s had revolved around Trotsky's historical evaluation of the role of leading Bolsheviks in his Lessons of October. And in a 1929 letter to the editors of the Historical Journal, on an apparently obscure point of party history touched off a political purge in the historical profession and a general hardening of the line on what was acceptable and what was not. By the early 1930s, the Stalinists were generally more intolerant of publication from ex-oppositionists and scrutinized their writings more carefully. At the end of 1930, Bukharin could still publish statements about his position on various matters but their content was checked word for word by the Politburo before approval. A Politburo directive of October 1930 noted that Comrade Bukharin's statement is deemed unsatisfactory in view of the fact that the editors of Pravda were Comrade Bukharin to insist on the publication of his statement in the form in which it is sent to him by the Central Committee would be forced to criticize it, which would be undesirable. Comrade Kaganovich is entrusted with talking to Comrade Bukharin, in order to coordinate the definitive wording of the text of his statement. Bukharin's statement was eventually published, but only after considerable haggling over its content. By 1932, however, things had become even harder for veteran party literature 
Chopnikov, prominent old Bolshevik and one of the leaders of the defeated workers' opposition in the early 1920s, was taken to task for some of his writings on the 1917 revolution. In this case, though, it was not a matter of prior censorship of historical works. Shubnikov's 1917 and On the Eve of 1917 had already been published. This time, the new situation required a formal recognition of mistakes and published retractions from the author. Otherwise, he would be expelled from the party. In the new situation, the worried nomenclatura were taking command of history of itself by reshaping historical texts that had already been promulgated. In the Stalinist system, public Disquisitions which necessarily political could be repaired, and history itself could be changed along with them. Chaotic times made ideology and ideological control important because it could render otherwise incomprehensible social situation meaningful. So I'm going to cut off here. It is basically a decree about Alexander Shopnikov, basically asking him to publicly declare his works to be wrong and that they were to be removed. This is for the sake of time. Plus, without the surrounding context, it's actually kind of hard to know what the letter means. So, for context, I will quote from Barbara C. Allen's biography of Alexander Shopnikov. Until 1927, Shopnikov's books were only criticized harshly by those who thought he had unfairly depicted their own roles and views in the revolutionary events. Reviewers used typical scholarly standards in evaluating the books. Yet, in 1927, several historians published articles in the party journal, Bolshevik, an historic Marxist, calling on him to revise, to base it more on Marxist theory and less on the documents he had used. The very significant changes for which they called included glossing over the differences among Bolsheviks in early 1917 to make it seem if all agreed with Lenin, and forcefully distinguishing Stalin's views from those of Kamenev. At the same time, Shubnikov's role in 1917 came under attack, as critics accused him of rejecting the proletarian revolution. Taking umbrage at his critics for failing to provide evidence for their assertions, Shubnikov was astounded by their insistence that he falsify events of which I was a participant and eyewitness. The attacks on him were part of a general shift in the historical profession after 1927, in which bourgeois historians were dismissed, arrested, and imprisoned. Remaining historians had to glorify Stalin's role in the party's history and present it as consistently united. By 1930, many other Bolshevik memoirs were also being dismissed or attacked. Nevertheless, Shopnikov's fourth volume of published in October 1931, was document-based. Moreover, he did not surrender to the trend towards glorifying Stalin and demonizing figures such as Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. At the end of October 1931, Stalin crashed hard on the historical profession, condemning those who relied on documents as archival rats and hopeless bureaucrats. In a letter to the editors of the historical journal, Proletarskaya Revolutionsaya? God, I hope no one watches this for correct pronunciations. He insisted that the party's interpretation of revolutionary history was not to be questioned or disputed. Subsequently, in December 1931, in the journal, Bolshevik, a team of scholars from the institution read professors extensively vilified all of Shopnikov's writings on revolutionary history, calling their publication a mistake. His histories were deemed Menshevik falsification, and the editors who allowed their publication were guilty of rotten liberalism, Stalin's term. For those who did not read party historical and theoretical journals, in 1932, Pravda published an article by historians condemning Shopnikov's memoirs for paying insufficient attention to Stalin's role in 1917 and incorrectly analyzing Stalin's role in other actors in the revolutionary events. Shopnikov appealed against the Orgboro decision to the Politburo, asserting that Lenin had not objected to his books. He was certain that many of the critics had not even read them and pointed out that some of them had not even been Bolsheviks in 1917. The majority of the works that Shobnikov was being attacked for aren't in English, however, there's a summary of the events of 1917, and this is likely at what he was getting in trouble for repeating, and I'm quoting Barbara C. Allen's summary of the events from page 80 through 81. Similar to Lenin, Shopnikov and the Russian Bureau opposed the provisional government and called for the Soviet to form a provisional revolutionary government, which would have had the agenda of ending the war, establishing a democratic republic, the eight-hour workday, confiscating landowners' estates, supplying the army and urban population with food, and calling a constituent assembly. Some historians have assumed that Shopnikov merely implemented Lenin's orders. Nevertheless, there was a subtle difference. The emphasis he placed on cooperation with other left socialists indicated that he did not merely to secure a dominant political opposition for the Bolsheviks. 
The Russian Bureau's membership expanded throughout March, as Bolshevik leaders returned from prison or exile. Of these, Lev Kamenev was the most prominent. He led the moderate Bolsheviks, who included Stalin. These Bolsheviks were closer to the Petrograd Soviet's majority assessment of the provisional government than they were to Lenin's views. They claimed authority in the name of the former Bolshevik Duma delegation. The Russian Bureau was struggling effectively with the moderates. Although the Bureau at first rejected Kamenev as a member, he circumvented it by taking control of the Bolshevik newspaper, Pravda. Kamenev's group also outmaneuvered the Russian Bureau on the floor of the Soviet by supporting moderate positions in the name of the Bolshevik party. Unwilling to reveal disunity, Shopnikov and his allies did not speak. When Kamenev's 15th of March Pravda editorial supported continuing the war, consternation ensued amongst Bolshevik activists. The method of the moderates forcing through their own views without consulting rank-and-file members were as much at issue as their policies according to Shobnikov. Further, the content of Pravda was not so blatantly defensist, but it still did not publish a large part of Lenin's letters. Moreover, by the 18th of March, Kamenev had persuaded the Petersburg Committee to vote for conditional support for the provisional government. Chopnikov, long resenting the moderate steps in his memoirs, he declared that Kamenev and Stalin had pursued a non-revolutionary policy. They had disunited the party in March by introducing into the leading bodies of the party disagreements and deep organizational frictions. Attributing his troubles with the group to the intelligent origins, he argued that Bolshevik intelligence often feared going too far in opposition to the government and bourgeois society. Shobnikov must have been relieved when Lenin arrived in Russia to take up the struggle against the bourgeois provisional government. He had helped Bolsheviks in Europe arrange the sealed train that transported Lenin and the other Bolshevik emigres across Germany, Sweden, and Finland to Petrograd. He was among those who greeted Lenin at the Finland station. The Mensheviks and Kamenev's Bolsheviks were on the verge of reunification when Lenin arrived in Petrograd. Well, I am aware that Lee has a different interpretation of these events, which I also mentioned in my Bukharin video. I agree with Alan and Rabinovich's take on this. With this, let's go back to Chapter 3 of The Road to Terror. Despite the general tightening of literary discipline, the policy of censorship in the 1932-34 through period was uneven. In 1933, a circular letter from the Central Committee formerly prescribed policies for the purging of libraries. Back in 1930, during the ultra-left upsurge of the Cultural Revolution, the party has insisted on removing literary and historical works by the bourgeois and oppositionist authors from all libraries. The June 1933 circular, while approving of the removal of counter-revolutionary and religious literature, along with the works of Trotsky and Zinoviev, took a relatively moderate line on library holdings in general. Works representing historical interest were to remain in the libraries of the larger towns, and closed and special collections were forbidden, as was the mass purging of libraries. Even here, the Politburo had difficulty taking control of the situation. The 13th of June order was ignored by hot-headed local activists who continued to strip the libraries of books they considered counter-revolutionary. Yaroslavsky and other party leaders complained about this to the Politburo, prompting Molotov and Stalin to issue stronger strictures that characterized the purging of libraries as anti-Soviet and again ordering it stopped. Beginning in 1935, the policy would harden again as Stalin assumed supervision of the Culture and Propaganda Department of the Central Committee from Andrei Zhedinov. Large numbers of books would be removed from circulation and Stalin censorship would move in its full form. See Document 44 and 45 below. But in 1930-34, policy was still in flux. So, it was hardly decreasing as the espresso Stalinist was putting it. Some of these actions also might not make much sense if you're not familiar with Stalin. Such as Stalin disapproving of it, then later he took control himself and carried it out. But let me quote from Getty and then from Fitzpatrick, which I think sort of better explains Stalin and the Politburo's actions here. Stalin worked assiduously towards the goal of enhancing his power and centralizing authority in Moscow. I think this helps clarify the real reason just in of itself. Stalin and others were more upset about the local initiative taken, especially given that later on the orders of carrying out the purging of libraries continued, but that they had to be under the control of the NKVD, which was much more directly under Stalin's thumb. At every step of the way, there were constituencies both with and outside the elite that supported repression of various groups, sometimes with a greater vehemence than Stalin did. The terror was a series of group effects, though the groups changed frequently, 
rather than a matter of one man intimidating everybody else. This finding by no means takes Stalin off the hook or lessens his guilt, but it does mean the picture is more complex. Repression was as much a matter of consensus as one man's dementia, and this is somehow even more troubling. And as well, Stalin was not pursuing this in a purely cynical way from Getty again. That there seems to have been a few dangers for Unis or Trotskyists is beside the point. We have no evidence that aside from a few small discussion circles, there was any significant political opposition after 1932. If there was, it certainly never reached the scale attributed to it in official propaganda. Of course, there were personal institutional incentives to magnify this threat. The secret police had a vested interest in uncovering conspiracies, and both Stalin and the elite could use the threats of political conspiracy as excuses to tighten their control on many fronts. Still, the ways they spoke in public and in private and the ways they wrote to each other leaves the strong impression that they believed much of their own propaganda about dangerous enemies. You also have to be careful, just because Stalin says his position is X and Y document does not really mean that for, well, two reasons. One, it could be a variant text, and this is from Getty again. The production of variant party text in the 1930s illustrates the shifting political combinations and constraints which under even Stalin functioned. The multiple narratives of central committee meetings in 1935 and 1936 were aimed at creating specific political spheres for specific groups. As we have seen, the complex of text allowed Stalin to demonstrate his concern for the little people, a certain separation from Yezhov, and his displeasure with the elite without ever threatening party control by denouncing them too severely to lower audiences. Getty talks about variant texts more later on, but different documents and different versions of meetings were produced in order to please different factions. So if you were part of a local or group fighting with another, you might keep a variant text of the meeting that makes it look more like Stalin is on your side against the other group. The other way is Stalin, despite being responsible or supporting a policy, would sometimes really back off of it and make a certain distance in order to look better. Fitzpatrick explains in her Everyday Stalinism. Some of Stalin's cultural signals are even more minimalist, involving telephone calls to writers or other cultural figures whose content was then broadcast on the Moscow and Leningrad intelligentsia grapevine. A case in point was his unexpected telephone to Bulgakov in 1930. In response to Bulgakov's letter complaining of mistreatment by theater and censorship officials, the overt message of the call was one of encouragement to Bulgakov. By extension, the signal to the non-communist intelligentsia was that it was not Stalin who harassed them, but only local-level officials and militants who did not understand Stalin's policy. This case in particular was interesting because of the security police, GPU at this date, monitored the effectiveness of the signal. In his reports on the impact of Stalin's call, a GPU agent noted that the literary and artistic intelligentsia had been enormously impressed. It's as if a dam had burst, and everyone around saw the true face of Comrade Stalin. People speak of Stalin's simplicity and accessibility. They talk of him warmly and with love, retelling in various versions of the legendary history with Bulgakov's letter. They say that Stalin is not to blame for the bad things that happen. He follows the right line, but around him are scoundrels. Those scoundrels persecuted Bulgakov, one of the most talented Soviet writers. Various literary rascals were making a career out of persecuting Bulgakov, and now Stalin has given them a slap on the face. The signals with Stalin's personal signature usually pointed in the direction of greater relaxation and tolerance, not increased repression. This was surely not because Stalin inclined to the soft line, but rather he preferred to avoid too close an association with hardline policies that were likely to be unpopular with domestic and foreign opinion. His signals often involved a good czar message. The czar is benevolent as those wicked boyars who were responsible for all the injustice. Sometimes this play seems to have worked, but in other cases, the message evoked popular skepticism. When Stalin deplored the excesses of local officials during collectivization in the letter Dizzy with Success, published in Pravda in 1930, the initial response in the villages was often favorable. After the famine, however, Stalin's good czar ploy no longer worked in the countryside and was even mocked by its intended audience. Stalin as the good Tsar acts is a major aspect of how many modern Stalin apologetics often function. Giving flat-out denial often does not work anymore, so you try to blame other things, other figures, and people in the Soviet government at the time. So, about the archives. And see, this is the thing about archival sources in general. They aren't as good as many people think. Just because something is from the archives does not mean you should trust it implicitly, especially in the context of people's writings or, say, orders, 
And this is something I didn't quite grasp myself until I had read a few books recommended to me that uh, someone I knew who this was like the reading list he got for his introduction to histography course. And so I read them. And this one is from John H. Arnold's History, a very short introduction. The historian does not simply report from the archives. If he or she did, they would probably repeat half-truths and confusions, if not, indeed, downright lies. For sources are not innocent, their voices speak to certain ends, indeed, certain consequences. They are not mirrors of past reality, but events in of themselves. So, this is my warning to say, be cautious of anyone who claims to just be reporting from the archives, because it's really easy to lie from them by just grabbing one or two primary documents. Quoting again from the same book, but earlier on page 13, Past came without gaps and problems, there would be no task for the historian to complete, and if that evidence that it always existed always spoke plainfully, truthfully, and clearly to us, not only would historians have no work to do, we would have no opportunity to argue with each other. History is above all else an argument. It is an argument between different historians, and perhaps an argument between the past and present. An argument between what has actually happened and what is going to happen next. Arguments are important, and they create the possibility of changing things. It is for these reasons that throughout this chapter of the book I have used the term true stories to talk about history. There is a necessary tension here. History is true and that it must agree with the evidence, the facts that it calls upon, or else it must show why those facts are wrong and need reworking. At the same time, it is a story in that it is an interpretation, placing those facts within a wider context or narrative. Historians tell stories, and in that sense they are to persuade you and themselves of something. To round this all up, don't treat archives as an ultimate source of truth and cast doubts on anyone who's claiming just to be reporting from the archives. There are many ways to lie, either intentionally or unintentionally. And as I mentioned before, I myself at one point would have trusted these archives implicitly because they have to be truthful. They're archives, which I think is a way a lot of people approach it. And But we can't for the reasons that were mentioned above. Often, people doing this, I don't think they know that they're doing it. They're either accidentally using these variant texts or documents or various writings from where Stalin was trying to do the good czar thing, and they think they've found some secret truth uh, that absolves Stalin and, you know, proves that anyone who claims otherwise is just following CIA propaganda and if they would just read the archives. But the issue is due to their ignorance about these sort of things that Stalin did, they end up believing it. And the library censorship is just one form of this. You see it with regards to collectivization. They'll use the Dizzy with Success, as Vitrick mentioned, uh, where Stalin tried to distance himself from the policy. Or they'll pin a lot of the purges on Yezhov or someone else that Stalin was innocent in it. But when you have the full context and read more, it becomes clear that Stalin's trying to pass the blame. And of course, not everyone does this unintentionally. There are people who are out there to do this maliciously and lie to you. I hope you like this video, and this is not intended to be a complete history of censorship in the USSR or even Stalin's role in it in full, but more covering the distortions of Getty and the way that people will either cut up Getty or archive sources to lie to you, but also I think you've gotten a decent overview of some of these events uh, during the 1920s and early 1930s. and. You know, hopefully this helps you look out for attempts to deceive you as that is the intent of the videos to help you watch out for these things uh, and things that I personally look out for when viewing other people's content. You, of course, should always look up the sources and for my videos, too, which is why I provide the scripts. You can very easily find the document or book I'm citing and pulling quotes from and or paraphrasing, at least for my standard history videos. Ones like this where I'm just quoting a big block from one thing, I think it works better to cite the book in the video. Of course, the thing is that I don't do that an historian writing a book should be doing is providing notes and comparing sources and talk about competing ideas. And it can be hard to fit this naturally in a video. I'm trying to do better, such as, and I do it sometimes with such uh, mention of these alternative take on 1917, as well as some of my videos that are looking more at claims by certain historians. But in general, I feel I don't do this as well as a good historian would do in a book because it's hard to fit that into a video without making it exceptionally longer.
and kind of ruining the pacing. And this is possibly just kind of a limitation of the format, which is why I think you're best off to go read these sources. But it can be hard to find sources, especially in events you didn't know happen. And sometimes you want just an overview. And I think that's the gap my videos fill. And if you like this, please subscribe and share these videos around.